Welcome to Vox Gen. It is the best place you can find yourself on a Friday night. I am thoroughly convinced it is better than any football game. It's better than any tournament you can be a part of. It is better than whatever else happens on a Friday. Drinks, games, whatever. I don't care. This is the best place you can be and I, you cannot convince me otherwise. But we are in a series. We are in week three of our sermon series called Altars. Everyone say Altars. And in this series, we are talking about what, it require, what is required to follow Jesus. What does it look like to be followers of Christ, to lay things down at the altar? And we've been breaking down this idea of what an altar looks like. And it's a place where things go to die. And so we've been talking about the things of sacrifice, the things that we lay down at the altar before Jesus so that he could be known. And so today we are continuing and I wanted to read our scripture verse in Romans chapter 12. So why don't we stand for the reading of God's word? We are going to be in Romans chapter 12 verses 1 through 2. And then I'm going to flip to Genesis 6, 13 to 14. You guys ready? All right, here we go. Romans chapter 12, 1 through 2 says this. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not, be, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And then we're going to flip to Genesis. Go to Genesis real quick. It's the first book in the Bible. Genesis 6, 13 to 14 says this. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence, the, violence the, through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. I don't even know what that is. Make room in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. Can I get an Amen. And today I wanted to ask the question, as believers in Jesus, why does it always seem like we're going through difficult seasons? Why does it feel like as believers, things are always hard? Could I get an amen? Put your hands down. And I wanted to answer this question with a message I'm entitling, by testing. Look at your neighbor and say, by testing. Awesome. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, do what only you can do. We come expectant for your word to minister to your people today. And so we align ourselves with what you have to say. And it's in your son's mighty name. We pray all God's people said, amen. amen. Go ahead and find yourself. Go ahead and take your seats. Look at your neighbor and say, what's good? What's good? Amazing, amazing, amazing. How many of us in here um, likes taking tests? No, 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 no. All right, now be honest. I'm going to ask another question. How many of us in here... Have ever cheated on a test? Uh, all the private school people are like, I don't know about that. I didn't know I'm cheating. Um, but for me, in sophomore year, I took my first AP class. Bad idea. I took AP Euro. I don't know what I was thinking. My friends were taking it, so I was just like, you know what? I'm not that dumb. I can take AP Euro. So I took it. I signed up. I signed up, and I found out really quickly this is the worst decision I could ever make. And I remember I was sitting in the class. My teacher's name was Mr. Armstrong, a great teacher. And he said on the first day of class, here's your homework. Read pages 1 through 40. And I was like, hello? <laughs> 1 through 40? <laughs> what you talking about? <laughs> right? That's crazy. That's crazy talk, right? And so I go home, slightly excited, little, you know, like up for the challenge. And if you guys know anything about the AP Euro book, it's like, it's like fatter than the Bible. It's like bigger than the Bible, and it's like 8.5 font size, and you're just like reading through the thing, right? And for me, if you don't know me, my reading comprehension level is like at first grade level. It's bad. And so I was reading this, I kid you not, I can remember this from like just trauma, but I would read the same paragraph over and over and over, not to memorize it, I'm just trying to understand. I'm just trying to understand what in the world is happening in Europe, right? This is crazy. What's going on here? And so I would just read it over and over. And I was just like, I don't know if this is for me. I don't know if school is for me. And so we get into the school year. And I remember the first test is coming up, right? And um, first test is coming up. I'm super nervous. It's like 150 pages that were being tested on. And I'm just like, 
Lord, have your way, right? Lord, have your way. And so obviously I um, study diligently. I wait till the night before. I don't start studying till 10 p.m. I study from 10 p.m. to about 4 a.m. I see the rooster crow and then I get, and I, and I go to school. I get my Scantron that I had to pay for. And then I sit down. I take the test. And I'm going to be honest, as soon as I submitted, I was like, I failed that test, right? <laughs> Immediately, I was just like, I failed, right? And all your Asian friends are just like, how did you do? How did you do? And I'm just like, be quiet, right? All of them feel all confident. I'm just like, man, I failed that test for sure. But as Christians, sometimes we're like, I think I failed, but maybe God just erased some answers and gave me an A. You know what I mean? I'm just like, God, please. I got an F. I failed, right? I failed. So after failing, I, I had an idea. I was like, okay, if I'm going to fail and if I put in my hundred-ish percent effort, maybe next time I'm going to require some assistance. And so what I did was on the next test, I was a little smarter. I wore a oversized jacket, a zip of putty. I zipped it up just about halfway. I slouched so that there's a little pocket. And then I put my answers right here. I put it right there, right? And so I'm slouching and I'm just like looking at the answers, right? Here's the problem. The thing about history is that you cannot fit it all in a small piece of paper. You cannot fit it. And I'm trying to read. I'm just like, Louis the Seventh. what happened here, right? And I'm just like, Lord Jesus, please, right? As I'm cheating on the test, like, Lord Jesus, please, have your way, right? I failed that test. I failed it. And so I was just like, okay, I already cheated, so might as well dig in a little bit deeper. And so I was thinking, all right, how can I create a cheating ecosystem so that I can get the answers to the test? How can I do this, right? So this is, this is not made up. What I did was there was obviously like there was like zero period to six period, right? So my goal was I'm going to figure out who's in zero to first period, and I'm going to get the test early, right? I'm going to have my friends take a picture of the test. I'm going to have them send it to me. I'm going to practice and memorize the answers. And in exchange, I'll give them the answers or the test to another AP class. So there was this ecosystem that was happening. In the morning, they will give us this, and in exchange, we'll give them another test, right? Guess what? I passed the next test. It was crazy. No, no, no. You shouldn't be clapping. This is clapping. But my teacher caught on real quick. He's really smart. He caught on really quick, and then all of a sudden, now there's like five different versions. There's like A, B, C, D, E, F, G version. And then I tried it again. Guess what? I failed, right? I got the test. And I got the picture of the second test, and I looked at it, and I was like, wait a second. This is completely different from what my friend sent me. I got scammed. There were so many things that were happening in that class. It was wild. And so at the end of the year, after many failed attempts, after cheating over and over countless times, trying to study, being caught. I even got caught by my teacher. That's how good of a teacher was. He would catch me cheating and he would be like, he's going to fail anyways. I'm just going to let him cheat, right? Like that, that was just like, you know what, Ben? You can cheat anyways. He's the type of guy that like sits on your desk as he's talking to you. You're just like, I hate you, right? But he was a good teacher. And so the reason why I share this is that when you look at my year in AP Euro and you look at my test scores and the tests that I've been through, it's clear I am not a historian. I'm just not. It's clear from everything that I've been through that, through that, that year. It's Ben is not a historian. I don't even know if he's a student, right? I don't even know if he's smart. But for sure, he is not a historian. And I share it because the test brings validity to the title. The test that you go through will always bring validity to the title. What does that mean? There are only 273 wine experts in the world, and they're called master sommeliers. And what makes master sommeliers master sommeliers is that they have to go through rigorous testing. They have to have a historical knowledge in different languages, and they have to have a taste test of four different cups of two white, two red. They have to know which hill it was founded on, what kind of grape it is, the acidity level, all these different things. Yeah, they're literally just like, yeah, that's from that hill, acidity level, 14%. Mm, it's from this region, blah, blah, blah. All this stuff, right? I'm just like, this is crazy. It's wild. There's only 273 people, but it's the test that brings validity to the title. Only 2,000 people in the world have the title of chess grandmaster. 
nerd, I know. But they, only 2,000 people have that title. And they've gone through countless rounds facing different people all throughout the world to have that title. It's the test that brings validity to the title. And it's no different in the life of the believer, if you believe it or not. There is a test that validates the genuineness of our faith. A test that proves to the world and to ourselves that we are Christian, that we follow Christ. In 1 Peter 1, 6-7, it says this, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The genuineness of our faith is always tested. It's always tested. So when we read Noah in Genesis 6, you bet he was given a test. It's a crazy test. We'll read it again. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end to, of all flesh, and for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make your rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. Now, I don't know about you, but if God said that to me, if I woke up at 3 a.m. and I just get in my prayer closet and I'm just praying to God, and he's just speaking to me and he says, Ben, I'm going to destroy the world. <laughs> I'm going to destroy the world. It's wicked. And guess what? You're going to create a boat, right? I'll, first of all, I'll be like, God, is that you? <laughs> right? Like, God, is that you? You know how, like, when you feel like God says something to you, but you're not too sure? Where you're in that toxic relationship and God whispers to you, break up with that boy, and you're just like, God, is that you? I'm not too sure, right? No, no, no. If you feel convicted, that's the Holy Spirit. But back to Noah, back to Noah, back to Noah. So let me get this right. You're going to destroy the world, and you want me to build a boat? God, I can barely hang a picture on the wall, and you want me to build a boat, God? And for context, this isn't just an ordinary 10-foot boat. It's 450 foot long. I had to look up what 450 feet even looks like because I couldn't even comprehend what that is. It's the size of a modern-day cargo ship. You know those cargo ships that have all of those steel containers on them? That's 450 feet. That's wild. So if God told that to me, I'd be like, hmm. Okay. But it's not even the physical labor. There's a physical labor of it, but that's not what I'm worried about, God. God, people are going to think I lost my mind. God, it barely rains here in California, and you want me to build a boat? God, I'm going to lose friends in the process. And if I'm being honest, I've never seen a flood before. That's a new word for me, God. I don't even know what that is. It's a new word. God's got a new thing for you. It's called the flood. Um, but it's through these various trials that the genuineness of Noah's faith was being built. Noah hears a word from God and puts his hands to immediate work. And that's what faith looks like. It looks like, God, I, I may not know the whole picture. I may not know the next step, but I'm going to trust and align myself with what you have to say. I'm going to set aside my opinions and my worldviews and align myself to what your word says. So when your word says that marriage is between man and woman, God, I do not care what my friends say. I don't care what my professors say. I don't care what my teachers say. I'm going to align myself to what you have to say. God, if you say in your word, sex is for marriage and marriage alone, God, I'm going to set aside my preferences and save it for the wedding space. Faith is not just believing what Jesus said, but committing our lives to all that he says. You can't just pick and choose the parts of the Bible that you want. It's either all true or it's not. Jesus either died on the cross and forgiven your sins or he didn't. And that's the test, to not only stand with Christ in life, but also in his rejection, in his shame, his suffering and death. And so if you're a believer, this is for you. Galatians 2.20 says this, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. That means this life is no longer about you. You are not the main character. I'm sorry, like you're just not it. But it's about Christ being known as this. And the life I now live, I live by what? Faith. 
and the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So how do I live by faith? All of this sounds amazing. How do I live by faith? Somebody help me. And here's the good news. God knows how to engage your faith. God knows how to draw you closer to him. God knows how, God knows what ticks your mind to activate your faith. And he will provide a test in your life to engage and to stir up your faith. Noah, building a boat, engaged his faith. For Abraham, putting his son on the altar to be sacrificed, engaged his faith. For Rahab, he, she was hiding the spies. That is something that engaged her faith. For the bleeding woman that has been ostracized for years, for her just groveling on the ground just to reach the hem of his garment, activated her faith. And each one of these characters in the Bible had to make a decision. They had to cling to what God said, despite what the societal pressures and what the culture said about them in their world. Despite what the word, world says about gender identity, I'm going to stand on the truth of God. Despite what the statistics say about my generation that we're depressed and that we're anxious, I'm going to stand on the freedom that God has for me. So how is God engaging your faith today? Maybe it's a test of boldness among your friends to preach the word of God to people that do not know it. Maybe it's the test of moving towards the people that are lonely within your school, that one person that like has no friends and you've seen them over and over. The Holy Spirit is convicting you, but you're just like, God, I just want to hang out with my friends, right? Maybe it's that. Maybe it's the test of deciding to go to church on a Friday while your friends are out partying. Hello, you guys are in the right place. Bless you guys. For the rest of your friends, we'll pray for them after. I don't know what it looks like for you, but God is calling us to activate and to engage our faith. We are not called to be a generation, or we are not called to be a people of God that moves from one craving to the next. That where we stay in social media and we're swiping from one entertainment to the next. We're not called to go from hobby to hobby, to go from job to job to promotion to promotion. We are not called to go from friends to friends, project to project, relationship to relationship. Searching and seeking for the next dose. That is not how God has wired us as sons and daughters. It says this in James 1, 2 to 4. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet what? Trials of various kinds. For you know that the what? Testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. The testing of your faith produces a steadfastness, a steadiness to our lives. So we learned in Romans 12 that it's in the testing of our faith where we can discern the will of God. In 1 Peter 1, that it's by the testing that the genuineness of our faith is revealed. And in James 1, that the testing of our faith that produces a steadiness to our lives. So, I don't know about you, but when I hear all of the benefits of testing, I'm thinking, God, put me through the test. I want the benefit. I want it all. Put me through it. God, I don't care. Like, just put me through the test. I want the benefits of what it goes through, of going through the test. And I think this is it, where we need to have the heart of David. All jokes aside, where David says in Psalm 139, search me and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We need a generation that says, I don't care if I'll be embarrassed. We need a generation that says, I don't care if there's something I need to surrender. I don't care if I'll lose some friends in the process. I don't care if it doesn't look like the most optimal solution. I don't care because God, you're the only thing I care about. Test me and know me. So I'm going back to the original question, as believers in Jesus, why does it seem like I'm always going through difficult seasons? And I'll end with this Bible verse in James 1, 12 through 15. Blessed is a man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who what? Those who love him. What does this mean? Tests are only for sons and daughters. 
if you're going through a test right now that requires for you to cling onto Jesus, there's a good chance you're part of the family. And the test is not to destroy you, it's to build you up, it's to build your faith. It's to prove to ourselves and prove to the world that Jesus is our joy and Jesus is our love. It's laying down our lives so that Jesus would be magnified. And today can be your turning point where you decide that I want to be counted among the saints. Today I'm willing to lay down everything on the altar and align myself with the truth of God. Today I want to be known by Jesus and I want Jesus to be known. So we say, Jesus, put me through the test. Could we all stand? Like I said, we're about to do some ministry. Um, and I do believe that God wants to free some of us from the expectations of our friends and maybe even some of our parents. And so, um, man, I just believe that the Holy Spirit is just stirring our hearts. I believe that as the word was going forth, that there is a stirring in our hearts for the things of God. That you know that there's some things that we need to give on to God. There's some tests that we need to go through that God has ordained in our lives so that we could be closer to him. And I believe that the Holy Spirit is revealing those things. And so I'm going to read these two verses. In Romans 10, 17, it says, So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. And in James 1, 22, 23, it says this, But be doers of the word, not hearers only. And I share this because it can't just be something that lives in our mind, but it requires action. Love requires action. When we fall in love with Jesus, we just shift our lives because we fall more and more in love with him. And so why don't we all close our eyes?